for good grades. I wish I was better at relationships. I wish I was an artist. I wish I had a better relationship with my wife. I wish for a life full of happiness. I wish I may. I wish I might. Have to wish. I wish I might. Hi there. Happy Monday. Don't forget below, you can find the link to my free booklet on how to get more energy in your life. If you download the booklet, you'll get a few emails and then you'll receive an invitation to purchase a video that would help me work through the booklet with you to give you a sense of what it's like to work with a life coach. So today's podcast is about how we all are feeling when we move in this world and are treated the way we are treated by customer service and or mostly in this podcast, I'm going to be talking about medical facilities. Medical facilities are really coming up in lots of discussion right now because we have a shortage in Canada of nurses and we have hospitals full of sick people because of the pandemic. And now this winter with the other illnesses that seem to be surfacing. Almost every medical clinic you go into has a large sign saying a lot of directives regarding how they will not tolerate being abused by the patients or customers that are coming to their kiosks and windows. The first thing that comes to mind when I see a large sign like that is that it feels aggressive. And I know someone who has had an experience at work where someone's been aggressive to them, their first response is likely, well, do you have any idea how we're being treated? And I do have some idea. What I would love to see is a theory of explanation, education, teaching people what you want them to do. But in order to do that, I believe that you, the staff, you, the person feeling aggressed over, you have to also change your perspective. So before I start too in depth, I want to explain that my chosen profession when I was in my twenties was a medical secretary. I went to college for two years and I did that job for, oh boy, like from 1987 until 2002 or three. And I worked in an office that was quite busy. It had three phone lines. It was an x-ray clinic. And so there were six radiologists that we dealt with. <clears throat> Those radiologists owned the company. And I think that's the first step that we had that went wrong with the industry is doctors didn't really want to be businessmen. Not all of them anyway. <clears throat> and what has started to happen is that our clinics are being ran by business managers, people who are not medical. They're buying these clinics and they're turning them into businesses. <clears throat> and doctors are hired much like the staff is hired. That's been my experience. I went back to work in my 50s because I was basically finished raising my children and thought I needed to do something. And so I worked for eight months in a medical office here in the local small town I live in. <clears throat> It was fascinating to me how it had changed. And I was grateful that I had gotten back into the workforce because it gave me a sense of what my children are facing in the working world that is so different from the working world that I worked in. So this office that I used to work in, we saw um, 80 to 110 patients a day. We had three phone lines. We had multiple, um, we did mammograms and bone scans and thallium scans. We did a lot of different things. When somebody would call to book an appointment, we often were booking three different things for them. And we had to figure out if you were going to have a barium study, you then couldn't have another study shortly thereafter because of the barium still in your system. So there was an order that that had to go in. So it wasn't as quick as taking a look at a page and saying, how about 10 o'clock tomorrow, sir? So I know what it's like to do those kinds of jobs. And I also worked with one other woman in that front office. We did all of the billing. We did all of the payroll. We typed all of those reports and um, we did it all. And neither she or I ever felt put upon. Yes, we had some crusty customers, 
But you know, the thing I used to tell the girls that I trained when I would train people to do that job is that this is a medical clinic and people who are coming here are sick. And sometimes the fear or stress over their illness might make them not act appropriately. It was very few that did, but almost always, if I was typing their report an hour later, they had something wrong with them. And I would feel bad, even if in my thoughts, I thought, don't be so rude. And so I bring that to this discussion because now we're many years later, technology has made the jobs easier and easier in a lot of ways, in my opinion, compared to the kinds of things that we did when we typed a report, we had triplicate. Um, oh my goodness. I just forgot the name um, of the black component that would make the print go onto the other two pages and we had to tear them apart. And, you know, there was a lot of different work and I know technology was supposed to make things faster and better. And sometimes with technology, there are steps that we have to take that maybe we would all wonder if it really did do much to speed anything up. So I understand that. But when I see these large signs, well, first of all, I think I said, um, the very first time I ever saw these signs, they were maybe handwritten or just typed up on a little piece of paper and taped to the kiosk. And then now I'm noticing that they are printed. They're actual printed signs that are up on the walls of medical facilities. So if we could learn that when these people come to our wicket or window, however you want to call that, that we would give them the 30 seconds they need or the minute they need and not come across as I don't have time for you because I have so much other work I need to do, that would start a different approach immediately. I have stood at wicket windows where someone's on the phone and I get that you're on the phone and I'm just standing there because I'm waiting for you. And the attitude that has been directed toward me, not anything friendly right from the beginning, if you're not a reasonable person and you come from a place of feeling attacked, that doesn't start the relationship off very well at all. So what I think needs to happen. So then as a, um, so I have one, two, three family members who work as technicians in medical facilities and they do tell tales of harried people coming in and expecting things to be done right away. But I also think that some of that is happening because it's a two way street that is causing. So that person that comes to you and is rude and wants to be seen right away, we don't know how many times they've been treated inappropriately and that is their defense mechanism. I know um, I have found this in the past myself. When I called my medical clinic just recently to get my daughter in to see someone, when you answer the phone, technology has improved and it can say, you are number six, so that I have a concept of how long it's going to take me to be on the phone. I was on the phone 35 minutes before my call was taken. I have worked in an office and I know that that is an inordinate amount of time to be on the phone, waiting to be taken. So someone who has a half hour lunch and works five or six days a week and is trying to book an appointment with you, I know people who have had to take two and three days to sit on the phone during their lunch hour and not even get through. Now, some places are starting to have an online portal that you can book appointments through, but they don't always work well. And that technology is not maybe the best yet. The other thing I'm noticing when I go into clinics is that they have um, like an automated kiosk that you can just check in with your health card. So we've even removed the human connection of a hello, how are you? Um, some, you know, nervous person is now sitting in their own nerves even longer versus somebody smiling at them and maybe making them feel uh, just a little better because they've had a human connection. There was a discussion about cell phones. Should we have cell phones at work? Should they be put in a basket as soon as people arrive? And then that will stop some of that disconnect because I honestly think a lot of what's going on is disconnect. People are so caught up in their own things that it's like an irritant to deal with the person that actually is the reason you're there. And, but that's difficult. Cell phones have become an immediate contact. If your child is in school and a teacher can't get a hold of you on their break, there's a sense of, I tried to get a hold of you. 
Um, so it's across the board with the cell phone situation. And I heard one manager say, I honestly think my staff is addicted to their phones. There's just such a franticness to get back to their phone. And so that's another sub issue that we could talk about some other day. So if you work in a place where you are dealing with people across a counter or a wicket, I think you need to come from a place of this is not an attack on me. And what could I do to make this person feel a little better? A little bit of compassion, a little bit of empathy, a smile instead of a frown, and maybe an explanation. I know that my son who works in an in a emergency department says that sometimes people can be really pushy. They don't understand just because they see nobody doesn't mean that they're not working, the technicians. And I said to him, educate them you know, politely say, I'm so sorry. It seems like no one's here. We've had a bad car accident come in and you're next on my list and we should be another 20 minutes. If someone else doesn't come in, at least they understand and, or give them an option. If this is too long for you, you could come back. Usually this time of the day and give them a time isn't so bad. Have some communication instead of always having our barriers up that you are irritating me and I can't do what I need to do. And I know there will be those unreasonable people. I met them too. But there is a way to be. I had a man one time almost climbing through my window. His whole head and shoulders were through. And the people in the waiting room took him to task. So when a person is truly unreasonable, you will have support and people will see that you're doing your best. But this world that we live in where people are glued to their phone but can't have eye contact with me, that is bigger issues to me than people are rude and I have a difficult job. So I just bring this to you in a fashion of what can we change? Take down the big signs and explain to people that you're important to us and we we have a system and we would love to hear and put up an email or something that's being monitored that people can take out their frustrations they can text and say i've been here for 45 minutes maybe there is a technician that isn't doing their job i know that um, i have heard stories about that um, my son showed up early for work and ended up going to check in to see if he could start early. And he was berated because the people who had already been working had been called 45 minutes before he got there and nobody had come. And that's internal. That has nothing to do with the patients. That's the staffing. And so if that's happening amongst the staffing, then they're not going to treat a patient any better. The patient doesn't pay them. The patient has no recourse to affect that person's life. And so where, where did we get to that people take jobs and don't want to work the job they take? And someone else said, maybe we're paying people too well to stay at home. I don't know what the answer is. I'm not that intrigued to figure that part out initially. That's something that I think will come from a higher level eventually. But when I walk into a place, so then we went to the doctor finally, but so I waited a half an hour, I get through and then I ask if I can see the doctor and I'm told I can't see the doctor till the next day, which was fine. And when the next day came, we went and we were sent to the hospital. And so when we arrive at the hospital, we find that there's no one to check my daughter in and she's younger and hasn't dealt with this. And she was a bit anxious. And I said, just sit here and someone will come. And there was a lady buzzing around. And when she finally arrived, she said, oh, I'm sorry. The lady who does this is in the bathroom. So should she be able to check in my daughter? Is that my place to say, I don't know, but my daughter sat for five minutes waiting for this lady to come back from the bathroom. And then it took a little bit to be checked in. It took less time to have our x-ray done than it did for us to be checked in. And I'm not sure if that's good or bad. And we were fine. We had the time that particular day. But right beside where my daughter was sitting was a large sign indicating that we will not accept any verbal abuse from you. So where is the recourse for a patient who is not being seen or heard? How do they then speak? Or are they not allowed to speak? And if so, then maybe that's why you feel disconnected from the people that you're dealing with every day. And as far as the phones go, I know that that's a big 
problem. People feel like they're connecting, but there's nothing required of you when you connect in a way that's two dimensional. And we need to get back to our three dimensional world where people feel that they can connect and help and guide someone. And if you're there and that's your job, I'm not sure why it feels so put upon for people to ask questions of you and to look for direction from you and to expect that you would treat me with some sense of care. When the doctor's office gave me the appointment they gave me, I had said something like, you mentioned on the phone while I was waiting that there is a clinic that I could go to. We'd like to get her back to school. She's been off for a couple of weeks. She said, oh, as her voice lowers a bit, it's very political. You can't get into that very easily. And I thought to myself, wow, like that's not going to encourage me to want to treat that particular office if I was an unreasonable person with a sense of uh, fairness or she's she's like lowering her voice and becoming conspiratorial with me like oh let me let you into the inside track it's all politics and that's not doing the the office any good it's not doing me any good and really it's not doing her any good because she feels she must feel she has no recourse she doesn't know how to explain to me how it works and to me it made sense when she explained it in her lowered hushed tone that if you can get in to see your doctor within 24 hours they'd like to reserve the clinic time for those whose doctors aren't able to fit them in and that was fine. If my daughter took a turn for the worse, I could head to an emergency department, um, which is another whole topic as well as how our emergency departments are being used as doctor's offices. However, in my situation, that would have been an acceptable thing to tell me. And I, being a reasonable person, would have accepted that. My reason for asking was that it had been stated there was a clinic. Maybe she thought I wouldn't want to go to a clinic. But I was okay to do that, even if it meant I had to wait, if it meant I got my daughter seen a little sooner. And just an FYI, we have yet to be called from that doctor's office or the hospital and told whether our exam was negative or positive. I can assume it was negative because she has gotten better. But while we were waiting for the other three days post x-ray where she didn't get a whole lot better, had she needed antibiotics or something, we waited and I don't know. I don't know how they operate. Maybe if there had been something we would have heard or maybe we would have slipped through the cracks because I don't know how it works. And so that's really the job of the people running the clinic would be to make sure we all understand that if we don't hear from them, it means our exam was negative and have that clearly stated somewhere so that I don't call back. Now, I didn't call back. My daughter improved, but I might have been one of the quote, unreasonable clients who would call back and berate and be frustrated because I waited three days for a report I never got. And so I find that part interesting. And whose job is it? Who's not doing their job if I'm not getting the report? And if I'm supposed to check in and find out, then those directions should be given to me. And they were not and are not. So this is not a situation where people are mean and horrible to you who work behind a desk. You who work behind the desk need to find a sense of this is my job. I chose this job and I'm here to serve people and I need to accept and try to be the best I can be and not treat those people like they're inconveniencing me because they're standing in front of me needing something. And maybe we should look at those signs that are up that are saying we will not be berated and we should have a sense of we understand that all of us are busy and sick and troubled and we want to work our best with you. And here are a few guidelines that might make your wait with us a little easier. And I just can't imagine why that wouldn't work. Um, but you have to smile and you have to believe it and you have to want to help people. And I did work about six to eight years ago, again, in my 50s in an office. And I offered my resignation when I was told that I worked too hard. Because there were very gripey secretaries that I worked with. And I felt like I had gone back to high school. And it was not an enjoyable place to be. 
And I, I raised some concerns because I didn't desperately need the job and thought I would try and do what I'm ending up now coaching. And the manager said, well, I was going to my father's funeral. So she said she would do my job. And when I returned, we would have a discussion about what she could see might need changing. And her answer to me was that I worked too hard and I needed to slow down and take a break. And I offered my resignation because I don't want to work in a place where there's always work to be done. Obviously, if that's why everybody's so angry, but I was being told to not work so hard and I wanted to work hard. So I would like to offer that side of the coin to those of you who work behind a desk. And I'd like you to understand that most of us just want to be heard, seen, and believe that you care enough about me to make sure that the reason the clinic exists is to give me the help I need and that I will get that. And I am more than happy to be guided by the tenets that you have for your establishment if I know what they are. So I leave this with you um, as a possible solution to each and every one of us that wherever it is you work, whatever it is you do, put on a smile, have a moment that you actually care about why someone's there and remind yourself every day that your job is because those people are coming to that institution that you work at. And maybe they will be kinder if they don't feel like they are not seen. Thanks for listening. Happy Monday. As much as I enjoy discussions, I also want to provide a service to people who would like more. If you want to do more than listen, get in touch with me with the links in the description. You can also email me through hello at beyondwishfulthinking.ca. And I'd like to give you content you enjoy, so please leave a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. If you're watching through my YouTube channel, leave your comments below. If you want more of Beyond Wishful Thinking podcasts, make sure to subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you are listening right now.